thank you very much for coming. Um, first, can I just ask a question? Um, should I use a mic? Should I want to use a mic? No, no, no. Yes, yes. yes. Well, I can't hear you. So I just can't hear very well. I'm just using So, if you project your voice, then it's better to hear. Yeah. Right. So, mic is a double sound. Oh, okay, right. So, poets, the readers would prefer not to. Just oh, speak up. But the readers have to speak up. And yeah, readers yeah. forget right. to speak right. up. Please, please. Poet and reading. Uh, All right, I'll speak up. You included, Paul. Yeah, here we are. Okay. I can't hear you. Right, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is a very special day for Isabar Press. Uh, we just published the 45th and 46th books and uh, launched them today. Um, the uh, Kobe um, Hotel and um, Eric's Brushwood. And um, <coughs> Also, it's exactly the 10th anniversary of the press. The uh, first book from Eisenhower Press, which is my own from the Japanese, I did my own first because I didn't know if I could manage to do a book well. So I thought, if I'm going to mess it up, it better be my own book rather than somebody else. And so I published from the Japanese, and it was published on the 14th of October 2013, so exactly 10 years to the day. So this is a sort of celebratory reading for, uh, of uh, some of the poets who, um, who have published with Eisenhower Press. And I'm enormously happy and pleased and honoured that such fine poets have entrusted their work um, to the press. And it's been a real adventure uh, for 10 years working with so many diverse poets from very avant-garde down to up to long to um, very traditional poets. So it's really been an education and an adventure. Um, I've always been interested in poetry for the last 60 years. Um, but I've never, and I've always written, but I've never really been able to commit to spending a lot of time until I retired. So when I retired in 2012 from the university, I thought, well, this is it. Last chance. So um, I you know, read up all the manuals and the software and all the other stuff and decided just to do it and um, it's worked out amazingly it's been so great doing it and so um, what we're going to do is we have 10 readers tonight um, and each one has five minutes I'm afraid so therefore we're going to go five minutes over at the end um, but I hope you can stand that at the end of the day what I'll do is I'll make a very very brief introduction to um, each reader and we'll do it in um, alphabetical order by surname just so you know so we don't have to argue about who goes next and um, so I'll, I'll do a very very brief bio intro, intro, introduction and then the poet will come up and read five minutes and then go back and then I'll uh, do the next, next intro so the first person who is B it comes right at the beginning of that, Janine Bachmann, who is a very significant figure in Japan studies, um, a scholar and a translator, a biographer of Masao Kashiki and of Yosama Akigo, uh, a friend and translator of Oroko Makoto, and she, she was a uh, student of Don Ki, so she's, um, you know, worked very strongly in the field of Japan studies. And her Isabar book is Ishigaki Ri, this overflowing like selected poems, which she has beautifully translated um, the works of the um, immediately post war um, great woman poet, Jenny. Okay, just a 30 second intro is Ishigaki Dean is a pre war and a post war poet. She was born about, I was just looking up her birth dates, but you were too quick for me. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> but I, th I think she was born in 1920 and died about 2008. Um, you can check when you buy the book. <laughs> it will have everything about her in the introduction. It took me six months to write that introduction, so it's very dense. Um, but she she's a poet. You know, I was just trying to remember with Lisa, but what is that? 
thing, do you do the police in different voices? Yeah, that's... Is that from the Wasteland? Yeah, it's the original title of the Wasteland by T.S. So you do the police in different voices. Well, she do the Japanese in different voices. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first voice poem I'm going to read is a very gentle autobiographical poem about her going back to Izu, where she was born, from Tokyo, where she was brought up when she was a child. So this is pre-war. Um, and the second poem, I, I call this first poem in her gentle voice. The second poem I'll be reading is called Bakugo. Um, I think probably everyone here knows that Bakugo is the comic Japanese monologue. And this is a very strong voice in which she masks herself as a comic raconteur. But she's really talking about her own post-war poverty. Um, you'll probably forget that by the time I start reading it. But for now, it's the gentle poem. So it's called The Sea and Apples. A steamship is passing along the coast of western Izu. From a bus on the cliffs looking down, you'd see what seems a green field on a quiet day, but is really the sea a glittering green surface, and slowly a small boat moving across it. I was in that boat. The deck was plenty big enough for me. The sea was brimful to the boat's gunwale. The sea was brimful to the shore, too. In the palm of my hand, I happily held a red apple, larger than my palm, and just the right weight. October, an autumn overflowing with ripe apples, and a boat supported by the tides, and me supported by the boat. Oh, sea, I felt your weight in the palm of my hand. In the distance, Fuji was standing cloudless. I was standing on the deck. Everything swayed. A steamship is passing by the coast of western Izu. From a village path, you'd see it disappear behind a tiny island. It's small, that boat. So this is her strong voice. It's called Bakugo, a comic monologue. In this world of ours, there's a man selling happiness and a woman who sings, buy a dream. In business, novelty's the key. Take it from me, kid. Pedal suffering, and you'll make a mint. I'll buy that, says I, and pile my old car high with everything from a heap of family gravestones to my dead sister's love letters. <laughs> Step right up, folks. What you see is what you get. Any of it's a safer bet than stocks. Sadness doubles, tribulation does too. Take this thick rope called kith and kin, twirl it once, and a child's born. Two twirls, and hey, it's a grandchild. Barely room for a body to perch on this stone-stuffed cushion here. Sit on it three years, and your hair turns white. <laughs> Do I have any takers? <laughs> The value of money, the value of possessions, the value of a graduation diploma. Why is it only things like that that struck the streets in this part of town? With all the smart aleck yak about intangible cultural assets and the like hereabouts, why don't the value of poverty the value of size, the value of souls, bereft of ambition, fetch the highest prices. 
Give me a family of six living in a single room and I'll show you a fortune in tears. Seven warehouses full. Think I exaggerate, do you? From a warehouse of tears, I helped myself to some little red bean drops of blood. How about some of this sweet bean soup? A 10 yen bowl, it hits the spot on a cold night like this, folks. It don't appeal. Then I'll have a sip myself. And hey, another. Okay, next is, is, is Yoko Dano, who writes in English, uh, always written in English and only in English, I think. Um, and she has, um, she, she was, her mentor was uh, Lindley Williams Hubble, who, who taught in, in Kyoto and Kobe. Um, and he encouraged her to write, and she's been writing ever since. Um, trilogy, Hagoromo, Aquamarine, Further Center, poems 1970 to 1998, with an introduction by. Gary Snyder, um, and she's working on a translation of the Kojiki, which in her third edition, but with, with new illustrations. And this is her uh, Ice Bar book, Women, Woman in a Blue Robe. So, yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Flower passages, one. Wisteria flowers almost touching the ground. I need a pullover for my lover. The young, not long enough to complete the fancy pattern. Two, lingering in my overgrown garden, I'm, I find citrus to my taste, dry nettles not. Pears resemble avocado only in shape. I realize I have no idea what on earth I am. Three, workmen are digging beside a Sosanka hedge. Why is this needed here? To carry foreign petals to the sewer, to keep your world flowing. <coughs> Four. A black flower tail fluttering from a mist of orange blossoms leads me to an empty hallway. Through a crack in the closed door, a shaft of sunlight pierces the dark. Squid ink, one of a thousand flowery goldfish fluttering in a huge LED lit glass bowl, my voice silently rising as tiny bubbles. Shaggy peaks shine before sunset. Lava erupts from a crack of a smile. A word is a tool that shapes bloody sea fish into exquisite sashimi. A slave of world in sorrow or delight, sole resident in the mushroom of a house attending sincerely on my chronic disease. Sandy maple trees burst in red and yellow, preparing for loneliness in deep snow and the, the approach of silence below zero. Wind 
beeps against the window, dim light leaks through a gasp in the crowd. The full harvest moon is nowhere in sight. In the deep sea, squids targeting fish always win the game. In love, they go into close, close rapport with their mates without any use of ink, ichthyologists say. Staring into the crystal ball is of no avail in looking for hairpins or the future. <laughs> Recipe for tonight. One, a spoonful of madness. Two, some kind of bait to lure a fish or the opposite sex. <laughs> Three, a phosphorescent simile. Four, a pinch of secret vice added to the chicken broth. <laughs> Cups and glasses not wrapped, clothes still hanging in the wardrobe, bundles of goods for removal on the floor. Stop falling, Sakura. I'm not yet ready to depart. Thank you very much. Thank you. She's terribly nervous. She wants to take a script. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can I have my piece of paper? <laughs> Thank you. I, I need it for the next one. I particularly like the recipe for tonight. Yeah. Who, who, who could resist? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Warren Decker lives in Izumi, Japan. Trapped in his doubts, but presuming he can, Write his way out by rhyming each line with his feet keeping time. He aspires to shine like a luminous wave of blinding compassion. But it was just a dim ripple the last time we asked him. <laughs> Great rapper, um, and he's had a poem in the Best American Poetry 2018. On you go. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much to Paul. Not at all. And congratulations. I'll be reading from the prologue. The only thing you really need to know to understand this story, um, which I'm going to read today, is our hero is named Craig. And the wife of our hero is Kana. And we're going to hear Kana's voice. And so, just since David is up front, I'm going to ask you to be Kana's voice. You only have to read that. Okay. Very simple. Okay? Mm -hmm. And their young son is named Ken. For his 41st Christmas, Craig's two item gift list consisted of an iPhone 6 and one kiss with Kana. He shifted closer in his frayed wrist plaid pajamas on the leather couch, a gift from her boyfriend as a teen. She slouched in black jeans and a fluffy white fleece. Craig stiffly leaned a little closer. He kept his hands in his lap. Ken napped in the back room. Craig's lips were chapped. But he finished his asahi, put his hand on her knee. And auspiciously, she didn't glare at him, suspiciously, pull her leg away or smack his hand viciously. Reaching towards her thigh, he surreptitiously glanced up at her eyes, still so fucking shy. <laughs> but she smiled and went closer, and then Ken began to cry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Craig sighed, Connor groaned, then left him on the couch alone, and went to check on Ken. Craig thumb-punched his iPhone 5. Now the next voice is an email from Craig's mom. Craigie, Samantha, Merry Christmas. Miss us? I had just one Christmas wish, which was a visit with my offspring's offspring with no scoffing <laughs> at my Christmas at the Isthmus plan. We were offering to pay for your airfare. We found a craw resort with hot springs and tennis courts. Listen, life is short, so no short, vague retorts. I need to see my grandsons. Ken and those corduroys looking so handsome, 
still overjoyed by presents, still riding Santa Claus and asking for a pony. Markle, with his Satan's claws, punk rock songs, and those rings in his lips, his wild purple hair, all his tales of his trips. It's really such a bummer that this Christmas was a bust. Oh well, let's try for summer. The logistics might be tough. With Dad and I in Singapore, Samantha in Toronto, Craigie in Osaka, but we have the chance we ought to go Arctic, fjords, somewhere none of us have been. I'm leaning towards Norway and I'm leaning towards when the earth is leaning towards the sun, maybe Mosa Lake, towards back for the solstice. I understand your plates are pretty full with jobs and kids. I remember, believe me, and I hate to pull in prod, but please it will relieve me just to see the baby steps of maybe planes taking shape. So reunion in June, sooner is better than too late. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, um, next is Gregory Dunn, who is, is a great poet of the domestic. Would, would that be fair enough, Gregory? Um, well, great, great poems about, about family, children, uh, and so on. Um, he's, uh, he had a book called Home Test 2009, some of which um, is, uh, some of the poems reappear in this his Isabel book, otherwise. Um, but he also was a friend of, and is a great knower about, Sid Corn and has published quite an accomplishment, which is a memoir of his, his relationship with Sid Corn, who, although they write Gregory and Sid write completely different sides, there is obviously a strong link there, very powerful um, link of influence and respect there. So, um, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, the domestic. Um, funny you should mention that. <laughs> um, we were just talking about Rin, uh, Rin Ishigaki, those poems that uh, Janine just read, and that family of six in the tatami mat room. And that would be me, uh, maybe, uh, with four <laughs> children. And uh, it was always a pretty noisy place to try to write. Uh, now they're all gone, which is, uh, you know, as it should be. Uh, away. But uh, this, uh, this poem is called uh, Drifting, and uh, when I was uh, in school years ago studying with a uh, fiction writer, he was mentioning how important it is for writers to be able to drift, that you can go and sit all afternoon sitting and looking at the paper and, and not getting much done, but just drifting, and don't sort of sell that short, it's okay to drift. And so this is called Drifting, and it's uh, for that Professor John Keeble, short story writer in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. To wake with a kind of grace and not feel harried, how easy to be swept off into the current of life's demands. I'd rather be more able to drift into seasons, to attend projects and chores with eyes ready for the least disturbance any blade of grass turning in the wind can make. To be a hunter who realizes the fullness an instant offers. To accept here and now the unexpected gift of learning how it is. To let disturbance enter you and turn you out towards its life. Then I might be more able to be the man I want to be the father lifting his children free from fear of disturbing his day or breaking his holy train of concentration. Here I am, I'm pounding down the stairs, I'm running through the kitchen to see what's happening this time. And there they are, the children, too scared to say a word of how the vase was broken. Only their tears and their open arms to guide me past the shattering into the station of this attentiveness. Okay, and then I'd like to do a short poem. Uh, we were talking a lot about short poems today, and um, 
This is called Ikebana. I'm sure everyone is familiar with Ikebana. Um, a fistful of lotus buds soaking in a vase, ready to open any moment now. And I will finish this one, uh, another one for a teacher. This is for William Stafford, who was again a Pacific Northwest United States poet of some renown. Uh, I had the opportunity to study with him in Washington State. He passed away some years ago and there was a memorial for him. And a critic named Jonathan Holden appears in here. He spoke about um, um, Stafford's way of writing poems. They seemed to be very easy for him to do. Um, he didn't struggle a whole lot and so on. Anyway, this was uh, after the uh, memorial service for him. <clears throat> and we were up in uh, Mount Hood National Forest in Oregon. His wife spoke of his readiness to drop anything at a moment's notice. His readiness to run and help a neighbor who might have given him a call his response was always the same, be right there. Imagine the presence of mind so prepared as that to say whatever I'm doing now can wait until I see about you first. Maybe he was a genius, as Jonathan Holden said, a man who made his poems with pleasure and ease. But her quavering voice tells me he was also someone who understood how many a poem remains because it was left along the way, unwritten, to do its work in time, the way a logger might plant the finest trees by leaving one behind, the tallest, strongest one, to seed the forest back again, alive. Thank you. Soon after I started the press, I was looking around to see which poets were, were in Japan, Japan who I didn't know about. And, and Jane recommended Jessica Goodfellow. So I Googled and arrived on your website. And there was the story of your first book, which won a prize, got published, and then the publisher went bankrupt. <laughs> 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 and so I looked, went to Amazon JP, and they had one copy. So I bought it and I read it. And at the end of the day, I sent her an email. And the result was a republication of her first book, um, The Insomniac's Weather Report. She, since then, she's done um, uh, Mental Earth's Mandala. She's a scientist and a mathematician, so perhaps you can tell that from the title. And also a, a, a remarkable book called White Out, which is about your uncle um, who died on Denali, Denali uh, in Alaska. Um, quite a few years ago, and the impact of that death on family. Jessica. Yeah, I really, really have to thank Paul for rescuing my first book. <laughs> it was yeah. just a tragedy. It was so mm. depressing. Um, here's the new copy. Okay. Um, the first poem I'm going to read you, I wrote... Um, on a day that I was like, why do I live in Japan? I don't have any friends here. And I was on the way to a wedding of, of my husband's, from my husband's family. And I knew that they were going to pull me on stage and have me give an impromptu speech because it happened every time I went to a wedding. <laughs> like, look, we got a foreigner in our wedding. And so I was really cranky. And on the way to the wedding, I just grabbed a piece of paper and I wrote this poem. <laughs> and it's called Poem for My Friends. I have no friends. <laughs> My friends have no friends. On the way to a wedding I don't want to attend, I pass a homeless person scuffing along and I think, I could do that. I need never go to a wedding again. My solutions are more drastic than my problems. All my friends are friendless. They cannot be counted on. 
I cannot be counted on. Whatever it is I count, there is always one missing, or two, or more, or else there's an extra. I cannot concentrate. My friends cannot concentrate. There is an underlying noise, a whirring sound in this world. It catches me off guard. Though when I strain to hear it, as I do now, I cannot hear it. My friends cannot hear it. I have no friends. <laughs> This book is in four sections, and the fourth section is about an international marriage. Um, and so this is one of the poems about an international marriage. <laughs> it's called um, Shadow Dwelling. Dwelling in a foreign land, time is the only familiar tableau, last locus. Even your shadow falls aslant here, aping you strangely. Or are you really hunched and scurrying along the sidewalk? When did you grow so much smaller? It is easy to become nostalgic, one easy thing. Clearly, time is not a landscape to make a home in. Your beloved, in whose beloved city you now dwell, agrees one of you has an advantage, but who? Remind your beloved, dwell from Old English means to lead astray, to wander as ravel has twisted into unravel and also its opposite. Meanwhile, your fingers twirl a key ring. Abide, suggests your beloved, say you abide here, remembering too late that abide echoes to endure, to tolerate, to bear. <laughs> Are all the words for holding still so fraught? You both settle on reside free of overtones, swinging your legs over the balcony that overlooks the park where you go sometimes alone to feed the little yellow birds that remind you of your childhood home. Neither you nor your beloved suggest you claim to live here. Secretly you think you dwell here, you are raveling, you are unraveling, becoming opposite and opposites opposite. Only your shadow lives here, still having everything it always had, because your body is its roof, because you are its home, its homeless home. Mm. And then the, the first section of this book is about, uh, has water in every poem, it's about like wa every kind of water, like waters and waterfalls and glaciers and, and anyway, so this is the beginning poem which sort of argues about why all poems should be about water. And it's called, Why the River Flows Away from Its Source. All poems should be about water, or bones, and bones. Muscles like slingshots, cradling knees, each step wading through skin, sloshing. A flood you cannot be lifted above, turning toward a longing for home. A gold roof for the emperor, a blue roof for God. Have you grown crooked as a plum tree? or crooked as a black pine. You will not know until you get there. Your father, showing you bamboo, its straightness, said, each segment has a beginning, an ending. He was wrong. <laughs> your mother, when your first piece off the wheel, listed like a weft ribbon spider's web, said, never mind, what's nearest perfection is most easily broken. You've never made anything worth breaking. <laughs> See, there is no water in this poem. There never was. Thank you. That was great. Um, Jane Doritz Anagawa um, is, I think, the most prolific poet in the room. Um, 14 <coughs> books and pamphlets before this item of our book was poems new and selected. Um, and there's been a couple more since. <laughs> um, and this is her most recent book, The Rise of Art, and um, Jane read from it this, this afternoon. Um, and I think we'll read from it again now. Um, she's also um, the editor of um, uh, Women, Poetry, Migration, an anthology, which was published in 2017 which is basically concerned with women living in countries other than that of their birth. Uh, you know, crazy women, writers. Um, 
And then also this um, very remarkable work about the encounter with very serious illness and interventions to deal with that illness. So. Some of you heard me read earlier today. I read um, this is book uh, for those that don't know it. It's a combination of prose, poetry, and photography. So what I did today was read um, some of the prose excerpts, and I'm going to continue where I left off earlier today. Um, the heroine in, in the prose excerpts, she's undergoing cancer treatment for gynecological cancer and she's gone crazy as a result. And in the last episode that I finished earlier today, she was sorting medicine, or thought she was sorting medicine, and the room was very hot and the medicine was melting. That's her. This is a strange book. This is a strange book. Okay, it is a morning like any other where I was sleeping to the extent possible on a small piece of cold concrete next to my metal desk. Except when I opened my eyes somewhat fearfully, there were no other people or inhuman but living beings anywhere to be found. Outside the crooked cross-shaped window, which mirrors the cross-shaped tattoos the dragons planted on my body. Oh, and the dragon is a metaphor for the radiation machines. It comes up a lot in the which the uh, dragons planted on my body. The leaning buildings beckon. I eventually find a tiny door I can belly crawl through. It is very hot outside, the sun blinding, though I am already blind. But the oddly placed buildings and cobblestone streets are in beautiful shapes and colors. I try to create a route based on a particular rainbow I create in my head corresponding to the color of buildings. But as you can guess, I made a fatal mistake. When I got to a red building, the dragons were there waiting for me. Their red eyes propelled me back to the office room of partially melted medication. Since the medication was apparently quite expensive, even melted medications were fervently sought by those who could afford them or dispensed to patients who were told that the medicines had simply been altered to make them more easily assimilated by the body. One patient had apparently been waiting her whole life for her diagnosis. She was now near the end of life, over 90 years old. She had been told her illness was all in her head. There was no biological evidence of disease. But actually, even a lay person could see that her vulva was abnormal and her legs didn't match. Stubbornly, she refused to leave the hospital, even though she was all but ignored by the staff, except that they gave her medicines, which had been rejected or regurgitated by other patients, in order for it to appear they were treating her for something, albeit a something they insisted was imaginary. This was in order to justify collecting medical insurance payments. Had they not been able to obtain such funds, she would have been turned out onto the street decades ago. She had one good eye directed inward. Declared incompetent as to pill sorting, I am promoted to garbage collection. The problem was, I wasn't sure what constituted garbage. It seemed to be such a culturally bound idea. I could not distinguish garbage from something useful. To tell you the truth, most of the time it all seemed like trash to me. However, as my physician granted the institution extra funding for hiring people with disabilities, no one really seemed to check what I in fact did every day, whether I did anything at all. What a stroke of luck. <laughs> my luck continues to the one I loved who dumped me nonetheless. Temporary house, moving to another shore, unacceptable loss. Down the hill, fool's errand, silent landscape. Only you understand my true meaning. I dream of walls. Walls, my soul, repetitive pattern, rock formation, curved shape, riot of sound, abandoned body, watching the world. 
I look beautiful in this photograph of my waist and shaved genitalia. How young I could be. The doctor takes it out of the drawer and places, places it on his desk repeatedly. We look at it together with longing and tenderness, with some anger too. I think of the meadow in the summer with bright yellow and purple flowers, a bed of color touching your hands that you hope to merge with. Sometimes at this one almost feels successful. The medicines make me dizzy and confused as to what day it is. I've forgotten the code I developed to unscramble the chain of events. Is that five minutes? I think it was it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jay to R. Um, so first of all, R O, that's me, and then R O W, which is Phil. Um, so, well, you know, I, I'm the publisher, uh, so I get to publish my own book, which is great. Um, um, and I'm going to read just two poems from two different books by me. Um, the first one is The Painting Stick, which is mostly um, work from the 90s. Um, and um, um, this is my Freudian poem. Um, it's called Babel. Um, and I think that in the back, it, and the hero is a river. Um, and in the background, I think, is Tennyson's Babbling Brook, uh, which, which speaks in his poem. Um, men may come and men may go, but I go on forever, is the refrain. Um, and this poem, this river also has a chance to speak in the poem. Um, and there's a epigraph from Freud in a letter to, to one of his um, colleagues, Sandor Koleksi. So, this is called Babel. The weather, of course, never comes from the quarter one has been carefully observing. Sigmund Freud to Sandor Koleksi. The river is talking in its sleep as it flows beneath the big death. Trees. In the heart of its transparent heart, it remembers itself issuing cleanly from a cleft in the rock. But now it feels like a changeling, soiled and unstanchable, muttering and shivering in its muddy bed. I want to stop dead in my tracks. I want time to work things out. I want to know when I first made my mind up. I want someone to explain the joke. I want to give myself elocution lessons. I want to know where rain comes from. I want to know if there's any truth in the rumours I've heard of the sea. So much to know. So much to judge and master. But deep in the swim of itself, it knows it will never be the world's greatest expert on hydraulics, or hydrography, or hydrology, or hydromancy, or hydromania, or hydrotherapy, or even hydronomy. And daily, it reinvents itself, in spite of its most earnest intentions, in the slaps and slops which slip from its liquid tongue, in inundations, and divertissement, and cascades and escapades, and idols that would never have entered its head. Mm. Mm. That's my <laughs> and the second poem is the title poem from my latest book, The Pleasures of Peace. Um, this, this is my war poem. It is called The Pleasures of Peace. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I was, it, the, the hero of this poem was a flower. Um, it's Rose Bay Willow. Now, um, I don't know if Americans use that term, but it, it's a, a purple plant, and it's like broken ground or burnt ground. So in American, I think it's called fireweed. Um, but it's called something else in Britain, which you'll hear about it in the thing. And it loves broken ground, and I, I was, there's a lot of it in England, and I was um, surprised when I researched this to discover that it used to be rare. In the 18th century, it was a very rare plant very local, uh, but it spread in the 19th century as a result of the building of the railway system, mm. which disturbed all the earth, and it's now, it's now endemic, it's everywhere. 
Um, anyway, the hero of this poem is, is a single piece of uh, Rose Bay Willow Road on Hampstead Heath, which is a, a large open area in North London. But anyway, it begins with um, uh, much earlier when I was a very, very small boy who lived in London, not long after the war, uh, the Second World War. The pleasures of peace. Sirens wail and steel objects fall from the sky, giving banks and insurance officers heart attacks, axe blow spasms that shrug masonry off its foundations, building after building climbing down itself into the street to be consumed in fire. This happened before I was born, but as a small child, peering through gaps in rickety wire and picket fencing, I saw ruined saddles and shattered brickwork, tattered wallpaper adorning ghost rooms two stories up, traces of vanished stairways climbing propped up walls, and lakes of rose bay willow herb, sheets of ruffled purple mantling the rubble and bared earth of basements open to the sky. When a fire or other disturbance opens up the ground, the seeds of Cemirinion augustifolium germinate. Some areas can, after burning, be covered with dense stands of this species. In Britain, in the 1940s, the plant became known as bombweed, due to its rapid colonisation of the bomb. Seventy and more years on, the trees on Hampstead Heath heave their shoulders and rustle their spreading limbs like giants doing Tai Chi. <laughs> a sudden alarm call and an unseen blackbird thrashes away through heavy summer foliage. Lifting its head above the bed of brambles, a single purple flower stirs and sways attentive to the fleeting motion of the wind. Among trees, across grass, through bracken, skirting thickets, the path moves on like a thought. Thank you. <laughs> Philip Rowland, the master of minimalism. Um, he uh, edits a uh, new journal of the short poem online. If you don't know it, do go to it. It's fantastic. What he does is he, people send him very, very short poems, and he selects them, and then he puts them in an order, so he makes up a ranga uh, of uh, works of numerous poets who know they're going to be used in a ranga, but they don't know how. And he does that. It, it's a, each issue is, is a, an extraordinary multi-author ranga. And there's also... Um, there's a, a, a selection, Lumen Anthology of Short Farms, which does the same thing, 150 page book in Taranga, with about 50 or 60 uh, poets. Um, he's a good editor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he has um, two, he, Before Music was an early book from Jim Cashian's press, uh, Red Room Press, and these are his two uh, Isobar books. Um, and oh yeah, also he's co-editor of Haiku in English, the Northern Empire of Haiku in English, the first, um, first uh, hundred years. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I was just stressing out, trying to figure out what to read in a few minutes. But uh, this morning I uh, had a quick phone call and spoke to my 10-year-old daughter. And when I told her what I was up to today, she said, well, I, I assume you're going to read a few of those poems about me. <laughs> so I feel I must. Uh, actually, one of them, one of them um, is the sort of title poem, an open parenthesis includes that phrase. So this one is titled Accommodation, and it's in three short parts. Accommodation, one. You wish you could get it all down, let the roots dangle, showing the dirt. But then your child's sing-song chatter from another room simply bespeaks home, that sheltering, belated long moment, an open parenthesis. Two, 
leaving a place lived in for years, the walls of her bedroom now bare, the unfulfilled impulse to get down and pray. Three. My daughter's dolls laid out in her room, a fragile arrangement of dreamt-up dreamt up life that's hers alone, unknowably mine also. <laughs> Autumn evening. Hearing cries from the roof, I head up in my bath towel to investigate. My daughter claims to have seen through the telescope a log sticking out of stand on that bright star there up and to the left of the moon. <laughs> so beautiful, beautiful, she exclaims, still wide-eyed, holding my stare till I believe I believe her. <laughs> <laughs> on my way, on a bike in the rain, to pick up my daughter from school, reaching out to brush roadside bushes, the meaning in not knowing why. A couple more minutes, so I'll read something from uh, this earlier collection. I might have to do this one quite quickly, but it might lend itself to that. Um, this is one where I got a bit carried away with the idea of photos of poets, like you find on the backs of books. You know. um, so this is called Photos of Poets. Poet so sunk in thought, it seems doubtful he'll speak again. <laughs> Poet who has clearly done his thinking and attained an unassuming serenity. Poet with wife and artist collaborator in bed. Poet skateboarding a Paris pavement. Poet making a precise point. Poet struggling to keep her hair in place. Poet standing dazed in a sunlit glade. Poet in a dim light, lit only by his laptop's glare. <laughs> Poet hooded. Poet pushing back her hair to reveal an underarm tattoo. <laughs> Poet with her little dog, smiling on behalf of them both. <laughs> Poet hugging a life-size papier-mâché lion. Poet with members of the Ladies Bicycling Association. <laughs> Poet with a ripe apple. Poet in profile cut out from newspaper classifiers. Poet completely bald, clearly delighted. Poet stepping eagerly up to the rostrum. Poet presiding over his bone china collection. Poet arranging tulips to her incomplete satisfaction. Poet looking kindly in Tibetan robes. Poet with eyes only showing above his glowing t-shirt. Poet pixelated. Poet with a finger in each ear, listening intently. Poet on the verge of speech. Poet with hand on heart and a Panama hat. Poet with muscular arms crossed in front of a slatted fence or beach hut. Poet browsing through his many large books of visual poetry. Poet holding a disposable camera at arm's length, photographing himself. A poet with lips pursed in mid-decision. Poet in defiantly heavy lipstick. Poet nibbling his girlfriend's ear. Poet perched on a rock beneath a mountain pine. Poet hunched attentively forward. Poet with long hair and prophetic beard, who's just been listening to the Chico Panthum Quintet. <laughs> poet in conversation with another poet in a bare corner of an art gallery. Poet in top hat, holding a rubber toy replica of Godzilla. <laughs> poet in a snappy snakeskin suit, perched on the edge of a 70s hotel room bed. Poet at an antique desk in a see-through fluffy dress, nibbling her pen tip. <laughs> poet giving his best man speech. Poet giving a grizzled, disarmingly direct stare. Poet gazing out to sea. Poet awash in books, leaning back in his chair. Poet teaching cross-legged on a desk. A poet who refuses, on principle, to supply a photo. <laughs> a poet carefully lifting the lid of a piano. Thank you.
maybe you uh, introduced brushwork to the book of visual poetry, calligraphic poetry, uh, this morning, uh, which has just come out. Uh, it's a, a quite a new departure, both for you and for the press. Uh, it's, a, it's a purely visual book. Um, um, well, there is some handwriting too, but it's basically visual. Um, but um, I saw it published two, two of his own books, um, Art Tangent and Bait on the Stream, which are really part of a trilogy along with um, uh, The Condition of Music, which was published by Sync Press some, some years ago. And they're sort of like the, the philosophic high point, really, postmodern high point, uh, really quite striking um, in that way. Um, he's also translated, including um, uh, Nomura Kiwao's uh, book, sort of post. Um, 311 book, uh, yeah, 311 book, um, and um, which was selected as a, a poetry book choice, a poetry uh, society book choice recommendation for translation in Britain. Um, and he's, he's also uh, done other translations as well, so he, he's well known both as a translator and as a poet. I'm not sure what he's going to read, but I guess it's not visual. Okay, well, it's time for this. Uh, I'll read from just a few few pages. Arc tangent, <clears throat> sort of my first my first book with uh, with Isobar. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to speak loud enough. It's not really a shouting kind of poetry. But <laughs> <laughs> the slipper Arto held in his mouth at the moment just before his death. What remains is physical sensation, physical memory, connection to natural landscape, the priority of the whole. It is as if we are being told that it is only through the distortion of normative reality that we are capable of reaching its underlying truth. Nevertheless, he confessed his only recurring dream, a darkened room and a window's broken shutter through which an intruder attempts to enter, the enclosure. This time there was a complexity to the interior, many hallways and turns. As levels are added and topography evolves, resembling the profile of a cityscape, the difference between the most positive and most negative features increases beyond the depth of focus. The light is softer now, oozes honey-colored onto the myrtle and emerald ivy. Before the face, I find myself exposed this indispensable circumstance. The meal again becomes complex, the words abruptly following one another. But there are other factors, other voices, to explain nothing at all. Since the product must vanish, either or both of the factors must be equal to zero. Setting the first factor to zero gives the equation of a circle. The second factor gives the equation of an ellipse. No longer is there a fabric, but merely division. At the very place once occupied, there is now fragmentation. The fact that in it nothing is immediate, the divide, everything is refracted, significant, withdrawn. The rendering indifferent of the material, the moment of distress in the later period. Probably so. Five minutes. About another minute or so. What? You can take another minute or so if you want to. Okay. But you don't have to. <laughs> okay. Um, there's something short enough. Um, that night I dreamed about the entrance, barely large enough to squeeze the precious cargo through. The group labored into the night removing the metallic cushions from the movable parts on the interior of the machine. Night sweeps past the machinery, breath shortens under mask. The mechanical parts are discarded. Outside, blackbirds scatter after rain. Entering history, 
bits and pieces of decayed matter that come unconcealed. Chris Simons is um, the most formal writer in, in, in Jazz Barlet. He, he, great rhymer. Um, he, can, he can rhyme like nobody's business. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, I've seen him at work. He's <laughs> um, and um, he, he's done three books. Um, he, he did, did two pamphlets before I departed. And then three books. One more civil gesture. Underground facility, and most recently, flight roots. And just as an example of the, the formal work he does, is um, there's a poem in there about visiting the uh, exclusion zone in um, Fukushima. Um, uh, you know, much, much later, though, after the disaster, and sneaking in there to do a photojournalist gig, uh, taking photographs and you know, describing it, and so on. And, he, he writes a poem about it called Exclusion Zone, and there's one bit where he's arrived and the, the um, security guard has spotted him. And he does this section where he and the security guard are kind of playing hide and seek around the nuclear plant. <laughs> and he uses a triolet in the medieval form, which has repeated lines. And the way these lines repeat, it's like, you know, the, the, the security guard pop up and then they disappear and then they pop up again. And it's kind of like a, a whack-a-mole game um, <laughs> in a medieval first school. I've never seen anything like that done before. Absolutely remarkable piece of technical brilliance on it. Um, so, um, yeah, okay, I, I think that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. And um, since I'm, I'm last today, is that right? That's it, yes. Congratulations again on 10 years. That's a Thank tremendous you. achievement. I was there at the very first launch of the That's right. your book and Andrew, Andrew's the first two books. Yeah, there was Eric and Andrew and myself. And Dennis. Dennis. Yes, and Eric's at first three. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, this is this will be four minutes, and it's, it's four short poems, not including a medieval whack a mole, which is great. I've got to do it. You can. Um, Buy the book if you want to do that one. <laughs> <clears throat> Self-storage. This is the opening poem of Flight Risk. Haul up your storage unit's door and throw everything away. These things that you've kept have kept you poor. All that value you set in store, it was all fool's gold, worthless before it was worthless today. Throw it away throw it away. Carefully sort through the boxes and bags and throw them away. Your heart is a maze of shelves that sag under the weight of those boxes and bags. Once you were muscled like a stag, now you are grey. Throw them away. Throw them away. Choose a few treasures you can save and throw them away. Your mind is a bare room. Your fingers sieve for the gold of years you barely lived. Kneel in self-storage till something gives way. Those years, those days. And throw them away. Throw them all away. Here's the most precious thing you've stored. What till now you couldn't hear yourself say over the sound of tearing cardboard. The pain of some life you were working towards that you stuck in storage and now want to restore to the light of this artificial day. And what does that life say? You threw me away. <laughs> Match after Sir John Suckling, loving and beloved. Which one of us has ever made playing at love an honest game? In love, our honesty degrades integrity to a passing whim. In flirting, as in politics, truth and facts will rarely stick. 
To love and to be loved, that fights a cage match, conscience versus lust. I find myself on any given night playing someone I'd never trust. Still, we love deeply and fall hard, though who'd use that old word, romance? So we encrypt our secret hearts with casual words, with nonchalance, sharing photos of false happiness with strangers we might like to kiss. And in our beds, we'd rather trust our phones than who lies next to us. <laughs> Two more very short ones. Learning curve. 20 years now since our purebred Siamese, blind and with acute diabetes, passed. I'm remembering how my father ministered her daily shot by needle, how she used to purr, having quickly learned what was good for her in all the ways that I have not. <laughs> and end with, a, end with something light, so uh, here's some obituaries. <laughs> oh, <it's, clears throat> one. She is survived by a loving family, close friends, and terrible secrets. <laughs> two. He was an exceptional individual, one of the greats, or so he kept saying. <laughs> Three, she died as she lived, with great effort. <laughs> Four, <coughs> he accomplished everything he set out to do, although the death toll is still being calculated. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Jenny. Thank you, Yoko, Warren, Gregory, Jessica, Jenny, Bill, Eric, Chris. Uh, thank you for your reading. All of, it, all of them are great. I really, really enjoy them. I also want to say, and thank you for letting me publish it. That was nice. I really wanted to do that. And I also want to thank um, the people who I've published who can't be here Andrew Fitzsimons, Andrew Holland, Taylor Mignon, Masaya Saito, who all himself and couldn't get here. And um, Leslie Hardy in Ohio, Robert McLean in British Columbia. Peter Bacon in Lincolnshire in the UK, Peter Robinson in Reading in the UK, Roel Tyler in New South Wales, and Nadine Villens in London in Norwich in the UK. Um, they obviously couldn't be here, um, the bus fare is too expensive. Um, and also Dennis Lord and David Silver's finances, who, who were uh, very early people who I published, but who both can't be here definitively. Um, away some years ago. Um, but all these poets I'd love to work with. So thank you very much. And thank you very much to everybody else who came uh, and who have supported the press uh, by attending the readings and listening to poets and buying the book. Right. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for coming. And, um, you know, thank you especially to the poets who read today. Really. Thank you. Thank you.